Good morning, everybody. This is Danielle Delaquilla and Melissa Noor coming from drjockers.com. How are you today, Melissa? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm a little bit better. As you know, I've been pretty sick the past couple days, a pretty bad cold. Uh, my sweetie and I went to Montreal for the weekend, and at the very end of the trip, I started coming down with something. So I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I start sneezing. It's been so much better this morning so far, but I just want to put it out there. I've had a cold, so hopefully this will go well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's why Melissa and I weren't able to do this yesterday. We usually like to do this on a Wednesday morning, but um, I wasn't doing so well yesterday. So anyways, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Melissa and I thought that a good follow-up to last week's segment um, would, would, would be, you know, we spoke about immunity and uh, immunity and then autoimmunity, and now we're going to talk about ways to reduce autoimmunity in the body. So today we're going to talk about 25 ways to reduce autoimmunity, and we're going to, you know, focus particularly on nutrients um, that are important in um, reducing autoimmunity. So, Melissa, why don't you start off by uh, talking about the first couple? Well, you know, it's important. We always talk about diet mm -hmm. and nutrients, but it's also important to talk about what to avoid. And I know I talk mm -hmm. about this all the time, but those pro-inflammatory foods, we have to avoid those. So your processed foods, your sugar, your refined carbohydrates, conventional meat, all of those foods need to be avoided. But processed foods particularly, I wanted to talk about today because they have so many chemicals in them. They have GMOs, um, all kinds of preservatives and additives, and these alter your microbiome. So they promote um, bacteria and yeast to grow in your gut. Um, they cause inflammation, just a lot of damage to your gut lining, and that will promote autoimmune activity. So it's really important to look at your diet. Also what you're drinking, high quality carbonated or reverse osmosis water is much better than tap water. Um, environmental working group puts out a list every year and they, they actually go to your area and you can put in your zip code and look at the contaminants in your water. It's pretty interesting, but there's over 250 contaminants that they have found in the water sampling and testing that they have done. And those are industrial and agricultural contaminants and, you know, things we talk about a lot like chlorine and fluoride, but really important to have filtered water. So watch what you're eating and definitely what you're drinking. Absolutely. And sometimes people don't even think about like if you're going to boil something or if you're mm -hmm. making soup, like you want to use filtered water for those types of things as well. Um, so yeah, good, good, super awesome points. Uh, Terry's joining us. She said, good morning. Traveling and cold seem to go together. Don't <laughs> you know it, Terry. Oh my goodness. I wasn't even on an airplane this time, but I guess it didn't matter. Um, and Paula is asking about the link for that to get info on the water. Melissa, would you mention it again? What were you talking about? It's the Environmental Working Group, so ewg.org. They're the people that put out the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen list, yeah. but they also have the water list. So if you go to their main website, you'll see it on there. They awesome. have a lot of great information. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. And the next, the next um, topics um, I'm going to discuss is uh, chewing your food well. You know, Dr. Jockers is really into his liquid nutrition and making, you know, one or two of his meals every day uh, liquid nutrition. And the idea is that it gives our digestive system a rest, you know, the intermittent fasting, which you'll be talking about soon, as well as chewing your food well, having liquid diets like um, you know, when you consume a smoothie, say if you have a smoothie with the coconut milk and with the pulverized kale and whatever it is, it gives your body the ability to absorb these nutrients without doing so much of the work. Um, so it's a really good idea. So be mindful, even if you're not doing a liquid meal, be mindful of the chewing. This will help, you know, you feel satiated more appropriately. It's going to just bring mindfulness all around how you're eating, what you're eating. Um, so, yeah, that's I, I, I could be guilty of that. You know, like if I absolutely if I, it'll be two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, holy crap, I haven't even eaten yet. Because, you know, I get so busy with my work day and, 
and then I'll eat and, and I notice like, okay, you're not being so mindful of how you're eating. So it's, it's, it's good to be mindful, to be mindful of your eating. <laughs> Another uh, thing I want to talk about is improving your stomach acid levels. And this is going to be really important for killing off any of the bad microbes um, that come into our body. The hydrochloric acid being produced um, in the lining of the intestinal, I'm sorry, in the lining of the stomach cells is sort of our first line of defense against things that come into our body. It's also really needed for um, digesting proteins. It helps unfold the proteins to make the proteins better, uh, more available later on in the digestive tract to be appropriately digested. And as we know, one of the biggest uh, causes of autoimmunity is these undigested proteins leaking out into our gut, into our bloodstream from our gut and um, not being able to be recognized by our body listening to autoimmune response. Um, something else to be mindful of is eliminating food sensitivities. 45% of the population has food sensitivities. So it's very different than food allergies. And this isn't often recognized. Sensitivities aren't often recognized by mainstream medicine. Um, and it's, it's something that's can be hard to determine what exactly that might be because this is a very delayed up to 72 hours um, after eating the offended food, offense, offenses food. So um, following an elimination diet to be able to really determine your food sensitivities would be really important in uh, reducing autoimmunity. Go ahead, Melissa. So let's talk about the liver and gallbladder. You know, bile is the digestive fluid that's produced in your liver. It's store, stored in your gallbladder. And bile is what emulsifies fats and creates fatty acids that can be readily absorbed and used by your body. So bile obviously is very important for fatty acid metabolism, excreting waste, um, killing off those bad microbes, and your blood sugar metabolism. So really taking care of your liv liver and gallbladder health is important. I think that would be a great just whole topic in itself because there's so mm -hmm. much we could talk about. But using herbs like milk thistle, um, milk th thistle is great for detoxifying the liver. And um, we've got a few supplements that can help with that. So reach out if you want to talk more about that. But um, definitely keep in mind that your liver and gallbladder are critical for health and, you know, a healthy liver and gallbladder, obviously, are important for reducing autoimmunity. So something to be mindful of. Again, another mindful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Rosa has a question. Does showing in unfiltered water affect autoimmunity? I, I believe it's just one another one of those things that our body can get bogged down with these um, with too many, like too much fluoride, like our body can only process so much fluoride, so much chlorine. So it's things like that can just bog down our body and make it more toxic and make it more prone to autoimmunity. Wouldn't you say, Melissa? Yes, it's the toxins that we're concerned about. Toxins are a great stress on the body. And then if your liver and gallbladder aren't functionally functioning optimally, you're not filtering those toxins. So you can get a toxic overload in your body, which is extremely stressful and can lead to all different kinds of diseases. Yep, absolutely. So let's see. Next, I'm going to talk about improving your mitochondria. So um, when someone has autoimmunity issues, it's basically a clinical sign that there is some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction. So supporting the mitochondria with things like CoQ10, L-carnitine, and acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, all of these nutrients are really important to be able to get our mitochondria to work um, optimally. And our supplement called Brain Supercharge that we offer in capsules as well as a protein powder includes all of these ingredients and would be a really, really good supplement if you have some sort of mitochondria dysfunction. And uh, Melissa's favorite test that we offer is the organic acids test. And that tells us a lot about how our mitochondria are functioning. So if you have a concern about your mitochondria function, um, maybe ordering the organic acid test might be for you. 
So small and medium chain fatty acids. Small chain fatty acids are found in things like um, butyric acid. Well, small chain fatty acids are butyric acid, and that is found in butter and ghee. So always grass-fed, that's got those good fatty acids. But, mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out that a lot of people can do ghee even if they don't, if they're sensitive to dairy. So if you do have a dairy sensitivity, you may be able to tolerate ghee, and you'd be a great source of those small chain fatty acids. Um, coconut oil contains small and medium chain fatty acids, and they're called MCTs, which are medium chain triglycerides. Those are things like capric, caprylic, and lauric acids, which are powerful support for your microflora. Um, lauric acid actually converts to monolaurin in your body, and monolaurin is, um, has antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal properties. It's a great antimicrobial. I use it frequently with clients. So coconut oil is a great support for your immune system. And when you're dealing with autoimmunity, you have to focus on the immune system. You know, a lot of people with autoimmune thyroid are focused mostly on thyroid, but you have to, the immune system is what's out of whack attacking your thyroid. So we got to look at the immune system. So if you're working with a practitioner, you know, talk to him or her about that. Absolutely. Re reaching for that underlying cause, right? What's, what's right. causing that thyroid issue or what's causing that rheumatoid arthritis or whatever your autoimmune issue might be for sure. So the next couple of things I want to talk about um, are first carminative herbs, which help um, reduce, reduce stomach as well as intestinal pain. It also helps uh, peristalsis, and I, I love that word. I can remember learning about this mm. in like, you know, my uh, anatomy and physiology classes in, um, in undergraduate school. So peristalsis is basically the movement of food throughout the digestive tract. And mass peristalsis is you know, eliminating everything from your digestive tract, you know, into the toilet. So eliminating, going to the bathroom. Um, so carminative herbs, um, including things like coriander and cinnamon and ginger and fennel and cloves and uh, caraway, peppermint, thyme. There's a lot of different ones. Um, oftentimes these are used in combination with aloe to be able to help things move through the digestive tract. Um, to help alleviate constipation because sometimes people will have um, constipation issues, which of course can increase our toxic load in our body um, and also lend to uh, autoimmune issues. Some other things to use for um, helping with autoimmunity is drinking herbal teas. Let me tell you how much herbal tea. I've been drinking gallons of herbal tea the past couple of days being sick. And um, many of these herbal teas are really high in antioxidants um, and definitely favor uh, the microbiome in terms of, you know, promoting the growth of good bacteria. It's always a good idea to use organic, bioorganic tea, um, herbal teas. And when you use it in combination with good fats like MCT oil or coconut oil or grass-fed ghee, um, it just, uh, it's, it's a lovely thing that goes well together. I know Dr. Jockers likes to do that. So along with the carminative herbs, it's really important to make sure you do move your bowels. Some people, uh, before they come to me, have no idea that moving your bowels two to three times a day is what would be ideal. They didn't know that not moving your bowels every few days is not normal. Um, so it is a good idea to keep things moving so that you don't get backed up and have the ability, you know, give the opportunity for microbes to migrate up into the small intestine where they don't, don't belong. And as you and I know, uh, microbes that migrate up into the small intestine can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is, um, also referred to as SIBO. Um, so... A good idea just talking about stools is to look at the Bristol Myers stool, not Bristol Myers, the Bristol stool chart. I'm um, giving credit to a pharmaceutical company on that. <laughs> uh, the Bristol stool chart. And this gives you an idea of what an ideal stool would look like. I remember coming across this about, I don't know, eight years ago or so, six or eight years ago. I can't remember what it was. And and I just, I said to my kids, you know, at this point, they were old enough and I wasn't seeing their, their bowel movements anymore. So I said, here, kids. 
do your bowels look like this? And, you know, it's a good thing to check in with. I do have my clients take a look at it and just give me an I give them an idea and let me know like what, you know, are your bowel movements looking normal? Um, it does tell us a lot about this. So staying hydrated is also important to keep regular. Using teas, I think traditional medicinals makes a tea called Smooth Move. Mm -hmm. um, it's in peppermint flavor. It's in chocolate flavor. Things like this, like magnesium, vitamin C supplementation, all these things will help keep your bowels healthy and moving along. Intermittent fasting is the next thing. Dr. Jockers loves intermittent fasting. He really has taught me a lot about that. Um, intermittent fasting is basically when you go for a period of time in the 24 hours without consuming um, solid food. So a lot of times people will still consume the like coffee or the herbal teas and broths, things like that, but nothing solid. And we usually recommend starting with about a 12 hour fast. So 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And that's really pretty easy to do because you're just going to sleep. So most all of us can do that. But, you know, working up to 16 to 18 hours can be very beneficial because um, it really helps to give your digestive system rest. Like we were talking about earlier, starve the bad microbes. Um, and it's just a very effective strategy for a number of reasons. There's more and more science coming out about the health benefits of intermittent fasting. So definitely something to another strategy you can try if you're, if you do have an autoimmune condition or really any health condition, any kind of gastrointestinal condition, um, it, like SIBO, for example, would be another one. I use that with clients with SIBO just to give their digestive system a break and to starve those microbes. So something else to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. I love intermittent fasting. Kind of like started doing it and didn't even know it was mm -hmm. a thing. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And I think like when people um, sort of move to a higher fat diet, it kind of happens naturally. Yeah. Like, oftentimes hear people like, am I eating enough? I'm not hungry. I'm so satiate, satiated. I wake up and I don't even feel hungry. And you know, that's a sign that your body's burning fat, which is what we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. And Ada Dowden said, every time my son eats, he has a burning sensation. How can I help? Ada, I'm wondering if you're talking about in his stomach or if you're talking about like a reflux burning. If it's a reflux burning and you're going up the esophagus or the back of the throat, that could mean that he doesn't have enough hydrochloric acid in his stomach to be able to help with digestion. Maybe he's got an H. pylori infection in his stomach um, that would lead to sort of um, emissions of gases that can push up on the valve from the stomach into the esophagus and promote the, um, the reflux. So I would, I would uh, you can contact Melissa or me, check out our um, emails on our website if you have any more particular questions. Yeah, sometimes digestive enzymes can be re really beneficial. If they're not breaking down and absorbing the nutrients well, just a digestive enzyme. It, that, we have one called Super Dzyme that does not contain the hydrochloric acid. When you don't know whether or not his acid is low or high, I sometimes will just recommend the Super Dzyme. But there's a baking soda test that's really easy to perform. It's on our website. Yeah. Um, that'll give you a good indication of whether or not acid is low or high. And um, if it is low, there's a supplement called acid prozyme that has the HCL and digestive enzymes. But yeah. you know, important to test first so you'll know. Yeah, that baking soda test is great, Ada. And you could just search on our site like baking soda test and it, it'll come up. She did she did go ahead and, and send a message saying reflux. So yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, and the next strategy we want to talk about is grounding and deep breathing. So as we know, we are living in a high-tech society these days, and we're constantly being um, bombarded with these electromagnetic fields, these EMFs, whether it's coming from our computer, our Wi-Fi, even, even electricity and electric outlets and things like that. Um, so... Believe it or not, this is putting our body under stress. I have a longtime friend who 
um, for years, I've been having this argument with him about this. And, you know, he's in, been in complete denial. Like he was one of the first people to get the iPhone and I didn't have an iPhone forever. Um, and, and I would just tell him like, you have to worry about those EMFs and he, you know, carries it on his body and thinks nothing of it. And he's still not convinced, but it puts so much stress on our body that we can't even see it. And it can affect mm. our mitochondria health and cause inflammation in our body. So these things are, um, are very inflammatory to our body in so many ways that we need to be able to decrease the inflammation in our body and sort of counteract it. Like we can't live in a cave, you know, we are part of the, to the 21st century now. So we, we do need to learn how to function in our society, but in a way that protects us. And one of the things we could do to sort of counteract is spend time outside. Spend time outside with our feet on the earth, whether it be the dirt or the grass, or, you know, some people go out hiking and, um, and bare feet. I love to walk the beach barefoot, you know, no matter what season. And all of these things will help us um, get energy from the earth to help neutralize these damaging effects of the EMFs that we're extremely bombarded with. Um, something else to think about is deep breathing. You know, I think I think we all do this sort of naturally when we feel stressed. We'll take a deep breath in, and I, I think that it's something that if we practiced um, more frequently, more regularly, that we would probably be able to uh, deal and process our stress a lot better. So, you know, one thing to think about is aligning yourself, you know, getting in the right posture before, um, as, as often as you can throughout the day, because this allows more space between our organs, our diaphragm, you know, so our ribs aren't sitting right on our diaphragm, giving us the space we need to be able to uh, do the deep breathing, get enough oxygen, nourish, nourish our cells the way we're supposed to. So, um, Deep breathing also helps stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system, which is basically our body's way to restore and, and uh, reset. So uh, practice deep breathing as, as much as you can. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Graham said nature therapy. I love that. I try to get out every day in nature. You know, sometimes Melissa and I will chat in the morning and one of us is out for a walk and you know, it's often. So, so good to get that sunshine if it's sunny in the morning and that fresh air. And it's it's really good idea uh, of how to stimulate and get your day ready, uh, get yourself ready for the day. Oil pulling. Um, oil pulling is basically where you mix, you, you put a little bit of coconut oil in your mouth and you start to swish it around. It'll melt. A lot of people, you, you hear about oil pulling all the time, but I was thinking, I wonder if some people don't really even know what that yeah. means. And yeah. um, so you're swishing that around and that actually helps to reduce the microbial load because I was talking earlier about all the antimicrobial properties of coconut oil. So it helps to bind to those bacteria and the waste products from the bacteria that are in your mouth. Now, remember the critical thing is do not swallow it. Spit it into a trash can because if you swallow it, then you're just <laughs> swallowing all those bacteria. So make sure you spit it out into a trash can. Don't spit it in your sink because it could solidify in your sink once it cools down. Mm -hmm. um, so into the trash can and just spit out all those bacteria. This takes stress off of your immune system. And the strategies we're talking about today, the goal of the strategies is to take stress off of your immune system. So this is another way to do that. It can help um, reduce inflammation levels throughout the body. I usually recommend people do it two times a day. And, you know, you can do it while you're putting your makeup on or distracting yourself with email, like checking your emails in the morning. You know, it really can go by quickly and, I don't set a timer. I just tell people as long when it starts to bug you, spit it out, you know, yeah. so, um, but it can be very helpful. And then essential oils were another thing I wanted to talk about because they contain antioxidant compounds. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really good for helping to improve oxygenation and reducing the effects of oxidative stress. So some of my favorites would be lavender and frankincense and peppermint um, you can diffuse these, um, you know, you just mix them with some water in a diffuser. You can inhale it directly from the, from the bottle or applying it to your skin with a carrier oil is another strategy. So 
Um, essential oils are great to use. I know they've gained a lot of popularity in the recent years, so I'm sure most of you already have those, but, you know, get them out and use them. They can be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So I'm going to talk about um, probiotics, prebiotics, and probiotic foods. So it's really important uh, in some fashion. My preferred way to get probiotics into my body is eating fermented foods. Um, I've been pretty good through the years making my own sauerkraut or fermented beets or fermented carrots or whatever it might be that I have a surplus of at the time. Um, it's really super easy to do. Um, I did a video, a Facebook Live video on it uh, a month and a half ago or so. Um, so that's my favorite way. There's also kombucha and grass-fed yogurt. Um, but if you are not someone who likes to eat fermented food, because some people don't like the taste, I would recommend a high-quality probiotic, um, such as our ProBioCharge that we have. We also have the SBO uh, probiotics on our website. And it's important to, um, what they found is not the quantity but the variety of different microbes in our body is most important to protect us against things like autoimmune disease. Um, so we really want to try to work on um, changing our probiotics every three months or so. Rotating, you know, if you've got three of your favorite, maybe rotate them throughout the year every, you know, every three to four months. Um, and so once we put the probiotics into our body, we need to feed them. Otherwise, they might just be more transient. And some probiotics are naturally transient. Some um, just come into our body, do a few things along the way, and then we expel them from our body. So, um, but the prebiotic fibers are important. And these are mostly soluble fibers from the foods that we eat. Things like onion and garlic and leeks and sweet potatoes and starchy vegetables, chia seeds, um, carrots, dandelion, artichoke is another big one. Um, so it's important to not just replenish the bacteria in our gut, but also to feed the microbes once they're there. Speaking of microbes... Oh. Um, antimicrobial herbs, they're great to use for autoimmunity. Things like oregano, thyme, garlic, um, peppermint, again, is great, and basil. They all fight bad microbes and um, help favor the development of those healthy microbes like Danielle was talking about. One of my favorite supplements we carry is called GI Regulator, and it has grapefruit seed extract and bayberry, and then also berberine. Berberine is one of my absolute favorite things because it helps balance your blood sugar. It's got antimicrobial properties, a whole list of benefits to berberine. And that's generally very well tolerated by my clients, so I, I like to use that one. It's also important to use a binder. So um, activated charcoal or bentonite clay or two, we've got a couple of other binders on our <laughs> website, but... They help bind um, to the toxins and get them out of your body. And another way they can be used, if you've got a food sensitivity or intolerance, um, you can actually take the binder to help absorb the toxins from the food to get it out of your system. It's better to avoid the food, but if you accidentally took it or took something else that was toxic, you could take some charcoal. I always have it on hand here. So um the thing with charcoal is make sure you take it on an empty stomach um, and between meals without other supplements because it binds. So if you're taking it with other supplements, it's going to bind to those and take them out of your system. So you're wasting your supplements. So usually take it on, on its own around 90 minutes after your meal. Yeah. So Joyce Baldwin is asking, if you don't have stomach problems, do you still need probiotics? And I would say yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, just because you don't have intestinal distress doesn't mean your body doesn't have a need for probiotics um, for sure. Yeah. I mean, people people do tend to take probiotics um, if they're having intestinal distress. But I would say, you know, we're all vulnerable to, you know, just think of probiotics as being like our army. Um, it's our, it's our defense line to be able to fight against bad microbes. So if we have a strong army, um, then we're going to be better protected. You know, it's recommended of like taking higher doses of probiotics before you travel. So you don't get sick like I did. Um, so yeah, I would say there's definitely a need for that. 
And the last few things we're going to talk about are these different nutrients, uh, vitamin D, of course, I'm sitting on my front porch, which is really sunny. Now that it's, you know, November, I'm not spending as much time in direct sunlight <coughs> as I am in the summer months. So I try to catch, you know, some vitamin D on these sunny days whenever I can. If it's too cold to be directly outside, I'll sit in my sun porch and sit by the window. Um, so that's the best way to get vitamin D. If you can't get it um, via natural sunshine, of course, there's supplementation. Vitamin D3 is the one we recommend. I always recommend it in combination with K2 um, because I think it's really important to have that balance of your fat-soluble vitamins, also A. Um, but my favorite way to supplement is when it's already suspended in oil. Sometimes it comes in olive oil. We have one on our site that comes with MCT oil. So I really like that. Uh, B, B vitamins are... Um, also really important um, to be able to help with autoimmunity. And as we know, good sources of B vitamins would be our leafy greens, our pumpkin seeds, also good for magnesium, um, raw cacao, grass-fed dairy. And magnesium is really important with autoimmunity because it really helps control our blood sugar, um, helps make it, our blood sugar more receptive to things like insulin, which is uh, makes us more insulin sensitive, which is important uh, to control against getting diabetes. <laughs> it's also important for methylation issues. Um, and if you take uh, certain types of magnesium, like the, our magnesium three and eight that's found in our um, brain calm, it will help uh, with the blood brain, it'll help cross the blood brain barrier so that it has effects on our brain as well. Which is, which is really nice. I really like our brain palm, and I believe that's our best, best selling item, right? Yes, uh, very so, popular. So Andy's asking which magnesium is best to use. So our brain calm has a combination of malate, three and eight, and glycinate, and that's that's my favorite. That's what I'd recommend. So I hope that everyone uh, enjoyed this presentation today. There's definitely some questions we didn't get to, but I'll do my best to go into Facebook after this and answer some of those questions. I know Melissa, uh, that woman was asking again for that website. So maybe you could go in and type it in. I'll do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so everyone have a great Thursday and Melissa and I look forward to talking with you next week. If anyone has like a pressing subject that they would like to discuss, feel free to email me nutrition at uh, drjockers.com or melissa at drjockers.com and let us know what you want to hear. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye guys.